lying politicians and the lying media and it won't change until someone is able to communicate that vision yeah. of a clean air world. Yes, that is a very frightening thing. I mean, I, I very recently did something, I was involved in things that, that perhaps you mightn't approve of. I was involved in trade union politics. Um, in a major trade union, a, a trade union that has over 100,000 members, and I actually stood up at a conference and put forward this kind of view, the idea that we need to take a look at the shape of society, the way industry is developing, um, and, and restructure accordingly. And I was slapped down by the Deputy General Secretary of my own trade union for being irresponsible and suggesting that we ought to consider others outside our own trade union, which was a frightening thought. You know, the idea that a trade union leader would say, we can only consider ourselves. Yeah. It's awful. But that's what we're about these days. We are the policies of conflict and repair. And that's all. And the only way to change it is from within. But it requires persistence. When I was a shop steward in a trade union, I don't know where you get the idea, I would be against the idea of being involved in trade well, unions. Well, I know you're against power politics. Aren't Indeed. You? But when I was a shop steward in the trade unions in the bus industry, I argued quite strongly for free public transport. The buses should be free, particularly local buses. And quite honestly, do you know it would be actually cheaper in the long run to run a bus service for free because you don't have to have guards, you don't have to have all the fights, you don't have to have all the equipment for collecting the money, you don't have to have all the staff to count the money, to administrate the money, you don't need tickets, you don't need any of that rubbish, you don't need as many inspectors, and buses will run where buses are needed. Right, yeah, well, I mean, in fact... No way are, the industry, are these trade unions going to accept that. But, um, well, having said that, I mean, it's interesting because Sheffield City Council have done some experiments in that direction and have gone some way to proving the point. And indeed, Liverpool and London Transport have also run, although not to that extreme, they've run similar experiments. On yeah, they've, they've done cheap public transport, that's but that's not enough. The argument was for free. That's right. And if it's cheap, you've still got all the expense of money. Whereas if it's free you save all the expense of money. I know that sounds ludicrous, but buses, remember, lose money. Well, I mean, I mean, handling money is an expensive business anyway. Very expensive, level. particularly right, yeah. pennies and twopences. Absolutely. However, we're not going to change the world, Mike, but I'm sure we both would like to. Yes, absolutely. Perhaps not in the same direction. <laughs> Thanks for your call. Nice talking Cheers. to you, Alan. See you. I'll do, David. Hello, Alan. Hello. I uh, called into Red Road Radio today to pick up a photograph of you from my mother-in-law. I hope she's very pleased. Um, it's the first time I've been to church in a long time, I can tell you. Um, however, Sally Moon was there. I think I would prefer to look at her photograph than yours. Are you still listening, are Yes. Um, well, that's about it, really. But I would okay. like to comment uh, about the scouser who rang up, who's talking about ec uh, elocution lessons. He said he was embarrassed about his, uh, he was stuck with this, you know, um, dialect he has. Well, what I would suggest to him is to go and see that lady in Southport, um, to get big, massive shocks of elocu electrocution, rather than elocution, because there's nothing to be embarrassed about the scouts, uh, Again. <laughs> you seem to have come to a halt. I lost the red on. Don't worry, ring me back when you found it. Here's the latest news from John Wilding. First, the bad news. The Ford Motor Company have increased the price of new Fords. But now, here's the good news. John Wilding can still offer you new Ford cars at the old prices. An offer as good as this can only last for a short amount of time. So rush over to see the amazing deals John Wilding has to offer you. New Fords at old prices for a limited period only at Fairview Garage, Garstang. When you think about cars, it pays to think of John Wilding. John Wilding! Rose Radio, just the job.
Job Hunters. Do it with Red Rose Radio. Tune in any weekday at 9.30 or 4.30 to hear Just the Job, a selection of vacancies from all over Lancashire, including secretarial posts, manual and skilled work, sales staff, and a whole lot more. Just the Job is regularly updated and can also be heard anytime on our job line, Preston double five double one double nine. Got that? Double five double one double nine. Or pick up a written copy in reception. Just the job. It could mean just the job for you. Stay tuned. I'll do Roy. Hello, Alan. Do you want me to uh, sing your song or tell you what I have to say? I'd rather hear what you've got to say. Right. Well, my mate Simon Duffy at work, right? End of story. We don't use other people's names on this programme. Hello, Roberto. Cat doodles. I'll do Frank. Hello, Alan. Uh, I wonder could you give me a bit of advice, please? I, I bought a, a compact display from a local uh, electrical firm in Southport. That's better. Right. And, <laughs> um, <laughs> Go on. Um, it's lasted approximately five months. I'll, it broke down on Christmas Day, which was very annoying because I've, I've got some compact displays. <laughs> <laughs> yes, right. Uh, I don't know how they know it's Christmas, you know, but go on. I know. Well, anyway, I took it back the first day that this, this local firm was yes. open. And they promised it me back for the uh, New Year's Day when they were open again, which I was waiting for avidly because, like I said, I got some compact this yeah, right, and yeah. able to play. Yeah. So I went in on the on the New Year's Day and they said that it wasn't ready. So I gave them another couple of days after that. I went down this Saturday, just gone. They said they're waiting for parts from the manufacturers. Now, if they promised it for such a day, surely they in their contract they they should fulfill the promise that they made. I've even got it in writing to say that he'd be ready to pick up on the 31st of January. Uh, 31st of the January. answer is yes, they should honour the contract, but there's a term, a legal term, and it is the contract is frustrated. Now, when they make the promise, they make it on the presumption that they'll be able to honour it. But if, through no fault of their own, they are unable to honour it, then the contract is frustrated. And you could, technically, sue for compensation. But what compensation would you be able to quantify? What is the value of a compact displayer's use? Because all you've lost is its use. The capital value of it is still there. The repair will be done. So all you've lost is its use for the days since that promise expired. Now, how do you quantify the value of the use of your compact disc player? It's very difficult. Mm, yeah, it is very difficult. So, um, you could sue them for that loss. And if you won your case, and that's not altogether certain, but if you won your case, all you could be compensated for would be your loss. What is your loss? Um, only loss in pleasure of listening to ah. the present. Well, the company, ca the, the courts can't give you pleasure, they can only give you money. So you've got to be able to put it down to money. Mm. And it's difficult. Yeah. Well, they the said that the parts would be in within the next week, so I said I'd call back on this Saturday coming. Mm. If it has not been repaired by then, is there anything I can do about that then? Unfortunately, no, because you have allowed them that extension. What you need to do is to get very specific, and you need to say to them, well, I will now give you a reasonable time, now let us say another seven days, I will now give you another seven days, and if at the end of that seven days the equipment is not back with me and is not repaired fully and satisfactorily, then I want the equipment back and I shall take it elsewhere to get repaired and I will then sue you for the cost of that repair. But of course that requires A, positive action from yourself and B, there is a degree of risk. Mm. Uh, how much risk? The risk is that the amount it costs you to get repaired elsewhere may never be made available to you by the company because they will argue that you have been unreasonable and the courts will then have to decide whether you were reasonable or unreasonable in the time you allowed. It's a very difficult... no one can predict the answer. Right. I honestly advocate patience. Mm. 
I think works I wonders. Virtue, yeah. I think it is, because at least you don't have to spend any money for that. It's a frustrating problem, it's a difficult problem, but it, it's almost impossible to, re to guarantee a satisfactory solution. Thank you very much, Alan. Okay, thanks. Bye. Tara. Parry, how do to you? Hello, Alan. Hello. Um, what did the um, hurricane say to the coconut tree? <laughs> Hang on to your nut box. This is an ordinary blowjob. <laughs> you disgusting creature. Go away. Hey, you feeling blue? Because your car ain't right for you. Bradshaw's car delight. New and used, they've got it right. Cars with deal appeal. Lowest prices, it's a steal. Bradshaw's have today. 400 cars to drive away. So who you gonna call? Bradshaw. Yeah. Prices 54083. There's a car for you at Bradshaw. Who's the biggest Ford dealer? Bradshaw. Where'd you get the best deal? Bradshaw. I can't hear you. Hey, Bradshaw. Right. Right. <laughs> How do, David? Hello, Alan. Hello. Um, I've recently come to the conclusion that I may be suffering from depression, and my GP seems to agree with me. Um, I've been given some antidepressant tablets, but I wondered whether there was any sort of self-help method that you could possibly recommend. It's very difficult... There are no organisations that I'm aware of that specify in self-help for people suffering depression. The first step to recovering from depression is the acceptance that you are depressed. Well, I believe I have accepted that now. Right. Then that's step one. All you've got to do now is try to analyse why you're depressed, what it is that makes you feel so lethargic. part of what is lethargy, I'm surprised that you use that word. That is absolutely right. Um, well, don't be surprised. I, I did yeah, used to be a psychiatric nurse. Yeah, you did, of course. I used to say that. Mm. Um, I wondered whether there was anything that you could recommend in the way of reading matter. Do you live by any particular code? Or I don't live by a code, other than by the code of Bezik. I, you, may, you may reject this, feel free to do so, but one of the best cures I found for when I'm feeling blur, and that's what we're talking about, yeah? yeah? You're feeling blur when you get up and about blur when you go to bed, basically. right? Yeah. Pardon? About myself, basically. Yeah. The best answer, quite honestly, is fresh air and energy. And I've never yet found anyone that couldn't benefit from brisk walking in the fresh air. I know that sounds stupid and patronising, but it's call, true. Don't, don't go away, I'll be back with you after the news. Don't go away. The Midnight News, this is Alan King. The Europeans involved in the power game for Westland helicopters are saying if they can't win in the boardroom, they'll take their battle to the people. The European group increased their cash offer to keep in front of their rivals, the Americans, but the Westland bosses say they're still not interested. Westland wants the Americans as partners and say there's nothing more to argue about. But the Europeans are saying that they'll now go over the heads of the boardroom chiefs and will launch a nationwide appeal to tell Westland shareholders that their deal is best. Paul Maurice reports. Sir Raymond Ligo, the chief executive of British Aerospace, and now the acknowledged leader of the five aerospace companies within the consortium, revealed that Westland chairman Sir John Cuckney had told him that extra money probably wouldn't help his consortium buy into Westlands. Nevertheless, the Europeans are putting up the extra cash and claiming that the 1.8 million man-hours of work over three years is already better than the Sikorsky offer. A huge advertising campaign will now try and persuade the Westland shareholders to reject the Sikorsky bid. Paul Maurice, IRN, with the European Consortium. Customs officers made their biggest ever drugs haul last year, and there was a huge leap in the amount of hard drugs seized. Altogether, they reckon they stopped about £107 million worth of drugs getting onto the streets. But they admit there's no way of knowing how much got through their net, and there are fears of a cocaine explosion in Britain. Judy Laybourne reports. 
Customs and excise say they've smashed more than 70 drug rings with 1,500 arrests at British air and sea ports. The cocaine haul alone shot up by 125%. Chief Investigation Officer Richard Lawrence says the South American drug barons have set their sights on Britain as the best market for cocaine. And Home Office Minister David Mellor says last year's success doesn't mean the government will relax its campaign. We've got to find ever better ways of getting people to say no to drugs because as long as there's a demand for drugs there will always be ruthless people ready to be ingenious in bringing the stuff into the country. Only last month the government announced plans to strip drug barons of their assets in a bill expected to become law by the summer. The Marquis of Blandford, heir to one of the biggest fortunes in Britain, has been jailed for three months for breaking a probation order for possessing heroin. The 30-year-old great-nephew of Winston Churchill was told by a London magistrate, you become a common criminal. Antonia Higgs reports. It was only last Friday that the Marquis, heir to the £50 million Blenheim estate, was bailed from prison on a drugs conspiracy charge. Today he was back in court accused of breaking the probation order he received for burglary and possessing heroin. The magistrate rejected a defence plea that the Marquis should continue treatment at a drugs clinic. You have to be treated like anyone else, he said. And handing out the three months jail sentence, he told Lord Blanford, to the illegal taking of drugs, you, one of the richest and most powerful men in the land, have become a common criminal. The Football League is looking for new sponsors after the decision by sponsors Cannon to withdraw their support. The camera makers say they won't be renewing their £3 million contract at the end of the season. They say they want to put their money into other sports. And with the present television agreement also due to expire this spring, many clubs will be facing a struggle to survive. League Secretary Graham Kelly, though, says it's up to the fans to keep their favourite game going. Independent Radio News. <laughs> If you'd like to join us on the phone in, you're more than welcome. It's just after three minutes past midnight. Welcome to Wednesday. Drive carefully. The roads out there are disgraceful. Preston 561000 is the number for the phone in. Red Rose Stadium. We're back with David. Hi. Hi. Now, I was saying about brisk walks and getting out in the fresh air and the countryside and things like that. And one of the reasons I say that is that the, there's a symptom, I'll, I'll give you the, the, the technical term for it, it's a stupid term, it's called psychomotor retardation. And it's just like somebody's come along and got hold of your, your motor, your engine that makes you go, and turned it back a bit, so you can't actually get up the energy to go out and do anything. Yeah, I know exactly what I need to get myself out of the depression, but it's actually making myself do it. It seems crazy. I know how to make my life happier, but I seem to be completely unable to uh, do what I know I need to do. The problem okay. there is motivation, yeah. and there's only one person that can actually, at the end of the day, there's only one person that can provide that. Yeah. I hesitate to say this, but we'll say it anyway, and that is that antidepressant drugs will help, but for a very short time. Yeah. All they will give you is a breathing space. Well, I, I was amused when I actually collected the prescription from the chemist, because it says on the packet, it may cause drowsiness, and that seems to be my major problem. But yeah, that's the last no thing energy. you need. Yeah. It is a problem. That is one of the reactions of drugs. I often wonder whether they ought not to give you antidepressant drugs, but <laughs> to give you some speed or something and drive you crackers. It's funny, I've said that to a doctor. Mm. I feel as if I need speed or something, but... Um, but that isn't it. Out of hand. Yeah, quite right, too. <laughs> but it, it does... You know, just just looking at the problem, is me, is me, I'm down, I'm, I'm fed up, I'm bored, I can't be bothered, and yeah. what's it all about anyway? And this guy gives you a drug which basically convinces you that it doesn't matter. When, of yeah. course, it does matter. It matters a lot. It matters to me, yeah. Mm. Well, if it matters to you, that's the motivation. Mm. You've got to tell yourself. I know it's hard. I told myself on the 1st of January I would go for a brisk long walk every day. I've managed it most days, but some days, like today, I didn't manage it, primarily because it was a damn blizzard. Yeah. But I didn't manage it, and I now think, damn, I should have gone. Yeah? 
That's yeah. easy. It's easy at 12 o'clock at night when I don't have to correct it. <laughs> I can't correct it. But at 4 o'clock this afternoon when I was thinking I really ought to be out there on my hind legs instead of in here putting draft excluded on a door. You know, it's, it's not that easy. Yeah. But you've got to do it. I've heard you um, discussing in the past DCT. Um, is that for depressors or...? It can be used for depression, yes. Yeah. It has it been has used for depression. Fashion, um, that sounds an awful word for medicine, but fashion changes. Yeah. I'm aware that you're not entirely uh, in favour of ECT. I am entirely against it, yeah. as a personal view, but that is a personal view, and it's based only on personal experiences. Yeah. I have to, without hesitation, say that the medical profession do a number of things that I'm against. That yeah. doesn't mean they are wrong in doing them. It means they haven't convinced me that they're right. Yeah. I, it hasn't been I hope you can take the... Sorry. I hope you can understand the difference between those two yeah, things. Yeah, I do. It hasn't been actually suggested to me as a course of treatment or anything. Um, but it's I'm, not very... I'm looking for a drastic solution. Well, that isn't a drastic solution. There is an easier solution available to you, if you would but take it. ECT is very rarely used for outpatients. In fact, I, I'm not aware of its use for outpatients. And I spent a couple of years in hospitals. It is used for inpatients, people actually in the hospital, in the psychiatric ward or the psychiatric hospital. Yeah. It may be used outpatients, I'm not aware of it, but that really is a final resort. There's nothing after that. If that doesn't work, then, then we're in, you know, you, you start looking at prefrontal lobotomies and all sorts of <laughs> other things. You know, well, we're not into that. We're not on a descending scale. The problem with depression sometimes is that it's, it's not a descending scale but it's not an ascending scale either. It's just there, flat, plain, like the plains of North America. Nothing. And the only way to put some peaks and troughs into it is to make them appear, to go out and do it. Yeah. And it comes from the guts. It doesn't come from anywhere else. And I don't mean guts in this macro, hey, man, you need a few guts. I don't mean that kind of guts. It comes from inside. It comes from you. And only you can do it. Yeah, I think the whole thing comes down to motivation. Absolutely. So yeah. get some. <laughs> it's hard. Of course okay. it's hard. If it was easy, you'd be doing it tomorrow. Yeah. I'd but you are going to be doing it tomorrow. I will try. Good. Thanks very much. Thanks. You're going to do it tomorrow. Oh. Two miles on your iron legs. If that I'll doesn't finish you off, nothing will. <laughs> All right, David. Cheers. Cheers, yeah. mate. Ta-ra. I'll do Stephen. Uh, have you got a lip that's about 30 centimetres? Because I know a friend who has. And, uh, Have I got a what? A lip. A lip. lip. You know. No, I haven't. I'll do David. I'll do Alan. Um, I'd like to tell you about an experience that I had on Sunday. It was uh, very strange. Uh, well, one of my teeth came out just next to me, wisdom teeth, and I put it under the carpet, you know, the night before. And at the night, when I went to bed, uh, I went to sleep and I woke up and then came downstairs to, you know, to get a drink, feeling Thursday. There's a fairy there, so uh, give her one. I'll do John. I mean, Hello? incidentally, David, I don't think you've got the wherewithal to do what you said you'd done. Hello, John. Hello? Hello? Yes. I'd like to know why when people ring you up, 90% of the time, you just try and make such a wally out of him, call him a wimp, and did you say, him down. Did you say 19 or 90? 90, or most of the time, should I say. Well, uh, you say what you like, I'd just like to establish what it is you are going to say. Yeah, or before, before you get the chance to give you some stick back. Well, John, as I've just pointed out to you, without use of words of any great difficulty, it isn't hard to make people look wallies on this programme, because an awful lot of them are wallies. For example, you came on and said 90. I wondered whether you said 90 or 19 and asked you, so you immediately changed it to more than half. You see, John, the difficulty is that people do not know what they're talking about, and I include you in that. I never changed that. it to more than half, I changed it to most of the time. Most means more than half. That's yeah, what it means. 90 is more than half, isn't it? Yes, but so is 51. Yeah, well, I you said see, 90. Well, yes, you I said 90. 90. And then you said, well, more than half. A correction. Yeah, okay, can I finish? You can finish by all means. Yeah. Good night.
How do, Paul? Hello, Paul. Uh, you, you say that uh, a lot of people are, are wrong on your show, and uh, you, you are wrong, but you don't uh, give ch people chance to say why they're wrong, guy. Like, uh, I had an argument with you before about... What do you mean, give people a chance to say why they're wrong? I don't care why they're wrong. If they're wrong, they're wrong. I don't wish to continue a conversation well, with someone that is no, wrong. you was wrong. Sorry, I'm, I'm a mistake. I'm a bit I nervous. see. Oh, you're a bit nervous, yeah. are you? Well, never mind. Uh, I had an argument with you and you was on about galvanising being a... being a, an electoral plating, uh, uh, And you're going to tell me I'm wrong? You can't even say it. Ring me back when you've practised. How do Gary? Morning, Owen. Yeah. Right, am I right in saying the Queen was crowned in 1952? I think you are. Yeah, uh, could, have you any idea when her father died, King George? I think it was 1951. Yeah, right. What, what it is, I want to know. When he dies, there's a gap between his death and her coronation, right? Yes. So, does she immediately take the mantle of Queen, as it were? Yes. The coronation itself mm. is, if you like, the theatrical, it's the pageantry. Oh. It's the confirmation of what has transpired. I see. But oh. the actual line of rule, if you like, yeah. changes the second the king dies. Indeed, there is the said, the king is dead, long live the queen. <laughs> well, you still, reason, you still might. <laughs> it's worth no, a try. Just, uh, you know, because I thought there would have been enough old chillings with his head on to keep on running. But, yes, but uh, they change it straight away, I presume. Straight away, do they? Yeah, well, imagine the situation if they if they brought out a a coin just after the king had died and it still got his head on it. They're going to look right, perhaps, aren't no, they? No, no, but they wouldn't do that because the coins would still be in existence with his head on, wouldn't they? That's what made me think. I thought, why would they immediately bring out one with her head on? Well, they bring them out uh, at regular intervals, coins, don't they? The, the, the Bank of England just say, OK, we need some more shillings, Charlie, send us a van load or whatever, mm. and out they come. Yeah. So it was definitely 51 he died? Uh, no, I didn't say it definitely no. was, I said I thought it was. <laughs> well, if it was 52, then I, I might be in for a fortune. <laughs> you, you, and, you and me both, we've probably all got one of them shillings. Mm. Never mind, Gary. Well, I'll check up and I'll let you know if I... <laughs> All right. Well, let me know first. I'll sell mine as if right, mine's right. the only one. Okay. Tara, I'll do Bernadette. Hello, hi. Hello. Um, about two years ago, approximately, we bought this car, yeah? And I had to go into a garage for, like, a minor repair. It was something or nothing. Now, in the meantime, the garage had a fire, and there was two cars really badly damaged, and ours just happened to be one of them. And it was a complete write-off. Now, ever since, our solicitors have tried to contact, you know, the man who owns this garage, and he's failed to answer all, you know, written correspondence, all phone calls, and he won't give us the name of his insurance. And it's gone on now for about two and a half years, and it just seems to, like, we never get anywhere, really. And I wondered, like, what do you think? What do you mean by the question, what do I think? I mean, well, like, who's, like, I know that, like, we're not at fault, because... The car just went in there for like a minor repair and like the garage had a fire and there was two cars like really badly damaged. Well ours was a complete write-off but like every time he's been approached legally um, he doesn't reply to any letters, any correspondence and he hangs up on the phone. Mm -hmm. So like it, and yeah you know this garage is still sort of doing repairs and things but like we, we're not getting what has your there. solicitor suggested as courses of action available to you? Well, what, he was, what, what we have been doing for the last two years is sort of writing letters and things, but we've never got anywhere, really, you know, because they've all been sort of ignored and he sort well, of... Well, it seems to me that it's time you sued the guy. This is what I was thinking. I was thinking, like, you see, we were trying to think about, like, court costs. Would it, like, would we have a hell of a lot of money to pay? But really, I mean, they, they should really... Well, the problem is, to be perfectly honest, Bernadette, you've paid a lot of money already, or you will have to have done. Your solicitor's sending letters getting no results. He's not going to not charge you for them. He's yeah. still going to charge you for them. I mean, uh, he said that he's even rang him, and, like, um, the minute he said who he your was... Your solicitor sounds to me like he's a bit of a weed. Yeah. Well, like, we've been pressing it now for 
goodness, it's, 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 it's easy. What does he say? When you, when you go to your solicitor's office and say, well, what are you going to do next, what does he say? He just says to us, well, I'll write again and I'll keep trying and, um, you know, leave it with me sort of thing. You know, well, tell him, go to your solicitor and say, I want some positive action taking, otherwise we'll pay your bill, we'll have the paperwork and we'll go to a proper solicitor instead of you because you'd have jumped up little nothing. Yeah, do you think that, like, if we sued, that, like, we'd, we'd come off okay, we wouldn't have to pay all these enormous court costs? The something? answer to that is I cannot tell you. Mm. Yes, if you sued, you would have to be available to pay the court costs yeah. because if, if you win your case then it is more than likely that the court costs will be awarded in your favour mm. and he will be required to pay them. But of course you need to consider whether he's getting any brass or not. Yeah, this is it. You see, I don't think, I, you know, like, just, I just think myself maybe he's not adequately insured. He may well be not adequately insured, but, but you're never going to find out by writing letters that don't get answered. No, this is what I was thinking, because, I mean, why does he fail to answer any... I mean, he won't even give the name of his insurance company. Well, perhaps the answer now is to go for broke yeah. and just tell your solicitor to get him served with a yeah. summons. That's you can do that with a bailiff, get him served, and that's a step in the right direction, surely. Mm -hmm. Okay, then. All right. Thanks a lot. Cheers, okay. Tara. Bye. Dave, don't go away. You're next. It's sale time. You'll get no gimmicks and leftons, but you will get the biggest and best bargains in the area. Sale of hundreds of three-piece suites with savings of up to £500. A sale of great selection, high-quality, low-cost wall units, dining tables and chairs. Up to 40% off leading branded beds. We have over 500 in stock, all at rock-bottom prices. Oddmans to clear at crazy prices. See the same leftons, low, low prices at the massive walk-round showroom, General Street, Blackpool. The furnishing centre, Topping Street, Blackpool. And the bed centre, Church Street. Blackpool. Free delivery throughout the area. Find finesse in the Hounds Hill Shopping Centre and you found the handbag and luggage sale you've always dreamed of. Finesse is the handbag and luggage superstore selling quality handbags and luggage from all the leading names. So hurry to finesse while stocks last. Up to 20% off selected any handbags, 20% off selected Samsonite Antler and Delcy luggage, and a massive 40% off selected custom suitcases. So for those special sale bargains, remember to shop with finesse. Hounds Hill Shopping Centre Blackpool. Find out about buying a property in sunny Spain with London Spanish Developments, one of the country's leading Spanish property specialists. They have a superb range of apartments, Pueblo houses and villas in and around Marbella. Visit our exhibition this Thursday at the Pembroke Hotel North Promenade Blackpool and see our photographs and videos and discuss your requirements with the experts. Inspection flights are arranged every weekend. So call in between 12 noon and 8pm on Thursday at the Pembroke Hotel North Promenade Blackpool or phone your local agent, Offshore Property Developments. On Southport 48272. I am Odin, Lord of Asgard, God of Midgard, and ruler of Valhall, Hall of Silver and Gold, in King William Street, Blackburn. I bring you my personal pledge that the reductions on my finest diamond jewelry are genuine offers with as much as 50% off. Diamond rings previously at £450 are now only £225. Call in soon to Valhall, King William Street, Blackburn. I defy you to buy anywhere else. I don't know about you, but I'm terrified. How do Dave? Hello, Alan. Uh, during the Christmas period, um, my mum asked a friend to come and stay at her house over Christmas. And uh, this friend has abused that offer by um, telling her so-called friends that she was a, a lesbian, that she was going out with my mother. And um, I just wondered if it's my business to go and tell this other woman just to keep away and stop asking my mother. The question that you need, first of all, to consider is what does your mother want? Well, my mother's not, you know, she's like, she's... Uh, got her husband back, you know, like, like they come back over I the I didn't ask you that. I asked you what does your mother want? She wants to, uh, to keep her away and leave her alone. What above. does she want you to do? Well, I said to her... I asked know, you what your mother wants you to do. Now, mind what you said. What does your mother want you to do? She wants me to go and see her. Then, asking me... When you say your mother wants... Your mother wants you to go and see her, see who? The friend or your mother? The friend. Then if that's what your mother wants... Do you want to do it? Well, no, not really. Then don't do it. But, you know... Don't do it. Don't do something you don't want to do. 
it, but just phoning up and... Uh, Does it matter? Don't do it. If you do not want to do it, don't do it. Say to your mother, but be honest. Yeah. And say to your mother, look, I, you know, it's not my business, I can't sort it out. I'm sorry. So I just leave it down to my mother? Well, you, you don't leave it to anybody. You just decline to become involved in that way. You have your first responsibility is to you. Yeah. Okay, then. Okay. Thanks a lot. Bye. Cheers. How do, Mike? Hello, Ellen. Good morning. Morning. Um, you had a, a caller on, not the last caller, a uh, fella called David. He was on just before and just after the midnight news, um, talking about what he suspected was something called depression that he was experiencing. Indeed, and was diagnosed. Right, yeah. What I'd like to do, if it's permissible to yourself, is to offer him, uh, through this program, the benefit of my own experience in that direction. Go on. Um, because a lot of the stuff that he was talking about was something that I recognise, uh, having gone through it myself. Um, the idea of demotivation, wanting to do something, but not being able to make the connection between wanting to do it and actually conjuring up the motivation to do it. Uh, it's something that I've been through very recently and I suspect still am going through when I'm working on it. Um, and he also talked about being on, being put on um, antidepressant drugs and from what he was saying, although he didn't go into details, it sounds like he's been put on one of the tricyclic drugs, tryptophan or some such. Um, and what I'd like to say to David, if he's still listening, is that um, if he's still on these drugs, and if my experience is worth judging by, um, the best thing you can do is, one, take your counsel, this brisk, wear, brisk walking and, and fresh air stuff, uh, should do that, because it's important for him, I think, to go out and realise that no matter what he's experiencing, the world still exists and still goes on outside him, and he might as well be taking part in all that. Um, but taking it a little bit further is and as I'm only speaking from subjective experience, is that it might be a good idea for him to get off drugs and perhaps investigate um, the possibilities of psychotherapy rather than psychiatric treatment, um, which might enable him to investigate what is actually going on inside himself um, to find out what is making him behave the way he is, why he is experiencing this thing that we call depression, which is an awfully vague um, multitude of sins type description. I don't know if you want to add anything to that or, or comment on that. Indeed, the the advice is sound. Yes, depression is this multifarious thing. We, we don't know what it is, so we call it depression. And yes, drugs are a very dangerous in the sense of they can be supportive and become reliant, or you become reliant upon them. So one has to be aware of that. Psychotherapy, yes, it's a good idea. Unfortunately, it doesn't work for everybody. No, it doesn't. Equally, it can be expensive. It can, but it, it is, having said that, it is available on the National Health. It is available on the National Health. The waiting list is usually quite long, and most people end up saying, oh, well, I'll go private, and it can work out rather expensive. Yeah, I'm aware of that. I'm aware of that. But nevertheless, it, it just occurred to me that it might be a nice idea for him, if, if, if that option is available to him, and if he can um, take advantage of that kind of service, and if he's still listening, I hope he would at least consider it. Um, it it's one of those funny things, isn't it, that the people, oh, you're undergoing psychotherapy and, and, and all that sort of stuff. It's one of these, because despite the the sort of supposedly liberal society that we live in, it's still one of these things that's full of stigma. Um, uh, and I would hope that he would ignore all that and just go and do it because, as you just said in another conversation, it's important to look after yourself first because if, if you don't look after yourself, you're not much use to anybody else apart from anything Indeed, else. we all end up looking after everybody else and not ourselves, so everybody needs looking after by somebody else and Absolutely. on it goes. We all need other people. That's right. But, but we all need ourselves, don't we? Absolutely. We, we need to have faith in ourselves. Absolutely. Yes. The greatest problem facing the Western world, I think, is the inability for human beings in the Western world to understand themselves. 
And their own emotions. And their own emotions, yes. yes. That's yes. part of them. They are given so many... I, I pick the Western world because it is this, this media-conscious world. And we're now given examples of what we should be like, which we were never given in the past. When my dad was a kid, everyone was the same. There was the man in the big house, I'm sure, and his kids were different. But everyone in the street was the same. There was no competition. They right. just got on with it. And now we, we've, we've got this media identity of the 2.2 children cosmic family, or atomic family, or nuclear family, or whatever they call it. And it's all bunkum. It is. It's, it's all absolute garbage. Yes. We, we, we sometimes, we're, we're led to forget, aren't we, that, that, that at the end of the day we are our own selves. That's, uh, that's the only uh, person we, we are. Absolutely. Uh, and we're, we're sold a society in which we're supposed to that's right. behave as, as um, well, as a model. We're given models, aren't we, and we're expected to live up to those models. That's it. We, we and then we live in a life of failure. Absolutely. Because just because a woman wears a, a cross your heart bra isn't going to make her good at tennis. Absolutely. Just because I choose to wear some aftershave named after a pair of trousers, I'm not going to pull all the birds, as they say. Not that I want to, nor do I want to wear the aftershave. But those are the kind of images that we're given all the time that we can never hope to achieve. That's right. They make, they make us forget about ourselves. Mm. But having said all that, I mean, I've recommended this, this idea of psychotherapy to, what, a, what was his name, David? If he's still listening, I would ask him not to be put off by the fact that if you take the word psychotherapist and break it up a little bit, it spells psycho the rapist. <laughs> well, if that didn't do anything else, it'll give him a laugh, David. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mike. OK. Cheers. See you tomorrow. <laughs> Never thought of it that way, but it's in there. How do, Neil? Hello, Alan. Uh, when you're on at King George's Hall, shortly... Mm, yes, the 16th of February. 16th of February. A um, Saturday night, anyway. Why not take time off for a couple of minutes to pop into the video shop across the road? For a great selection, though, do you? We don't do adverts on this programme. And uh, not that aren't paid for, anyway. How do you, Karen? Hello? Hello? Well, what uh, do you want? Well, this morning I went down to sign on, and uh, they told me that I wasn't entitled... I'd, I'd, I wasn't entitled to no money, I had to go to the social. So I went to the social, and they said to me that they'd been up to visit me the, the three times, you know, three three separate days and on two of the days I was in but on the third day I wasn't in and uh, they claimed that I'm not living there at this at the house and uh, they say I can't have no money lodge an appeal immediately what do you mean you have the right to appeal against their decision so tell them you wish to appeal against their decision well, I, I, I phoned them up this afternoon, yes. and they said, uh, I spoke to a woman, and she said uh, she would have to wait to get some papers through, uh, and that I couldn't have no payments until these papers had gone through, and until I had another visit, and I'm due the money on Thursday. But that doesn't alter what you need to do. You need to appeal. You have had, you've been given a decision that says you are not entitled to benefit because you are not living at the address given, correct? Yeah. yeah. Now, there are a number of things that could possibly happen. It is possible that you could get a counter payment. That's a payment in cash over the counter or a gyro over the counter simply because you are without funds and possibly in their eyes of no fixed abode. Because even people who have no address are entitled to some form of income. So what you need to do, really, is to appeal the decision and get some very specific help with your problem. Presumably, where, where do you live? What town? Blackburn. Then go to Blackburn Citizens Advice Bureau. It's in... I think it's in... Is it King Street? No, it's not King Street. Richmond Terrace, thank you. That's right, it's Richmond Terrace, you're right. Anyway, it's, da it's halfway down there, on the left-hand side, going towards town. And if you go there and ask them, they will quite probably ring up the Department of Health and Social Security for you and find out exactly what the status quo is, exactly what's happening now, and then they can advise you on exactly what course of action to take. Okay. So go there tomorrow. Right, thank All right. you. All right. Cheers, Tara. How do, Jeff? 
Good morning, Alan. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I've got a slight problem, Alan. I listen to your program. It's fantastic. But could you let me know what the definition of unlawful and illegal is in legal terms? No. I Divert. thought an illegal was a poorly bird. <laughs> <laughs> I was good to say they're virtually the same. <laughs> now I feel lousy. <laughs> Ta -ra. Ta -ra. Nick will be with you quite soon. Blinking egg dead. Why don't you get a decent radio to match this flash car? Well, that one cost an arm and a leg, but it's never been much good. Now you need to contact West Orton Car Radio, mate. They've got superb systems by Blaupunk and Panasonic, such as the Blaupunk Miran, which will fit for under 100 quid, including the aerial and speakers. Hey, and they've got the Blaupunk D stock range at less than half the normal price. None of this distortion like with one of them. Blaupunk what? Blaupunk. It's German, isn't it? I thought you were supposed to be brainy. Hey, you can also get electric windows, vehicle alarms and car phones fitted by West Horton Car Radio. Oh, so find the right station with West Horton Car Radio, Church Street, West Horton. Phone West Horton 814-229 before you crack up. 108! It's your chance to win free holidays with Bullseye's Jim Bowen. Red Rose Radio and National Travel World are running the popular show Bullseye for three nights. On Tuesday the 14th of January we'll be at the Charter Theatre in Preston. On the 15th we'll be at Whispers in Barrow in Furness. And on January the 16th the show will be held at the Old Mill at Wigan Pier. Tickets are just 50 pence with all proceeds to the Heartbeat Appeal. Everyone who attends will have the chance of participating in the show and you could win a fabulous holiday along with other great prizes. National Travel World will provide free transport, so make sure of your seat and buy your ticket now at any branch of National Travel World or at Red Rose Radio Reception. How do to Nathan? It's not Nick, it's Nathan. Hello, Nathan. Are you going to speak to us? Hello. Very good. What do you want? If I had the wings of a swallow, I'm a bum and a great big crow, I'd fly to the top of Red Rose Radio... I'm clapping. Go away, you silly child. Hello, Diane. Hello, Mr. Bezik. I'd like to talk to you about dietary fibre. I feel that this is a subject many people don't fully appreciate the importance of. For example, yourself, Mr. Bezik, do you feel you take an adequate intake of daily dietary fibre every day? I don't know. Well, you seem to eat rather a lot of Mars bars, I've heard. That's then, true. You see, people don't realise that their bodies and their minds cannot function adequately without the daily dietary fibre. That'll be me excuse, then. I beg your pardon? I said that'll be me excuse, then. That's why I'm like I am. But wouldn't you think it would be very nice if your body and your mind could both be more agile and enable you to accomplish feats of amazing virtuosity? I don't want to be a virtual, so I haven't even got a violin. But wouldn't it be very exciting, Mr. Bezik? You don't know what you could achieve. I'm sure you've achieved... Excitement a is merely the forerunner of frustration. But frustration isn't always a bad thing, Mr. Bezik. I didn't say it was, but there's no sense getting excited about it. But I find excitement rather fun, Mr. Bezik. <laughs> I'm sure you do, but only because you eat all that damn lettuce and cardboard or whatever it is. Potatoes, Mr. Bezik, and Spons. brown rice. Right. Well, I eat brown rice.